All right, so we almost finished fluid statics, but uh, there were a few things that we didn't cover. I think we stopped right at hydrostatics uh, with curved surfaces, but we really didn't cover buoyancy, Archimedes principle, and then bodies that float or are immersed in a fluid, they have an upward buoyancy force. Um, and then also free fall of fluid bodies, let's say uh, uh, G, if you're going to free fall, if you have a coordinate system, it's as if there's no G. It's like a zero gravity. And then uh, if you have an accelerating system, you could have additional G or a side acceleration, not associated with the vertical. And then you can also have rotational systems. So Archimedes principle. So what is it? Do you remember from way back when? Yeah, if you have a body that's submerged in a fluid, it will have an equivalent upward directed opposite of gravity, upward directed force known as the buoyancy force, trying to push it up out of that fluid. And the magnitude of that buoyancy force, so here's the direction of gravity. If I have a fluid, right, talk about the density, not the density, the density is constant in a fluid, but something varies as I go deeper into the fluid. What is it? Pressure. Pressure goes up. So pressure is varying as I go deeper into a fluid. So if I have a submerged object, it doesn't matter the shape of the object. It doesn't matter what's inside the object. It's just an object. It could be lead, solid chunk of lead, solid chunk of gold, solid chunk of air, whatever, right? It's irrelevant what's inside my volume that is submerged. But this volume that's submerged will feel a force known as the buoyancy force, which is upward directed. And this is the key part what a lot of you are struggling with. What is the magnitude of that buoyancy force? Does it matter anything about the mass of the object? or the density of the object that's submerged? No. This is one of these incredible results. Archimedes' principle. The buoyancy force doesn't matter on the mass of the object or density of the object that's submerged. What does it depend on? The volume of the object. So if I have a larger object that gets submerged in the fluid, it will have a larger buoyancy force, so it's proportional to the volume of the object. It's also proportional to rho g. And what will a lot of students assume that that rho is of? They'll say the rho of the object, but that's not right. What is the density that's of interest? The fluid density. Because isn't the pressure, doesn't the pressure go up by what? Here, how about this? The rate of change of the pressure with respect to elevation is going to be uh, rho g, rho of the fluid g. And depending on if I have z going this way, then I need a minus sign. Because as I, or if I have z going down, then it's a plus sign in front of it, depending on which way I want to point my Ordinate, coordinate system, but it's changing with respect to rho of the fluid in G. That's how the pr so this density right here is the density of the fluid. Well, what is the product of rho times G? It's either gamma of the fluid or SG of the fluid. Gamma. And that's called the specific weight, something like weight density. It's how much weight per unit volume. So what's the product of the volume times the weight density? Not mass, it's SI units would be Newton, not kilogram. It would be the Newton it would be the weight of the fluid that's displaced by the object. 
So I encourage you to take a look in the textbook for a nice, clean description of Archimedes' principle. It'll be something like this. It'll be the net upward buoyancy force on a submerged object is equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced by the object, pushed out by the, by, by the object that's being submerged. So if I have a boat on the water and the boat sits there and displaces some fluid, how much fluid did it displace? It didn't displace all of the fluid of the size of the boat. It only displaced the fluid below the water line of the boat, true? And so the net buoyancy force holding the boat up will equal the weight of the displaced fluid by the submerged part of the boat. Let's say I put a big load in this boat, inside the hull of the boat. I put a lot of mass, a lot of weight by putting cargo, cargo, cargo. You already know what's going to happen to that boat. <laughs> Is it going to ride high in the water or low? Low. It's going to displace more water to provide the buoyancy force. Archimedes' principle. All right. Um, how do we derive Archimedes' principle? You've got to get what it is first before you bog, bog down in the math. Do this. Get a bunch of slender, pencil-thin type or even thinner, straw-type little cylinders. And if I could do it for one little cylinder, then I could take a whole bunch of cylinders and make this object up of a whole pile of cylinders that are aligned with the direction of gravity. Because in the direction of gravity, what I have is I have that variation of pressure as I go down in the fluid, further down in the fluid. It doesn't matter if it's over here or over here or over here. That's all the same pressure, all on the same uh, uh, level. But the pressure varies from depth, from the free surface. True? Okay. So you just have to do it for a very little uh, thin, little solid type of cylinder and understand it. So what do you do? You say, well, let's do a force balance on this thin cylinder. And let's talk about the net hydrostatic forces on it. So what do we have acting on the top part? The pressure on the top. What about the pressure on the bottom? The pressure on the bottom, are they the same pressure? No. Which one's higher? The pressure bottom. Isn't that equal to the pressure top? plus something. What is it equal to? Rho G H. So here's my height difference or delta Z. Okay? Okay, I'm a little prof confused, Professor. Which row are we talking about? I'm thinking about a solid bar of steel and I put it in water and I submerge it. Is that the row that I need right there? No, it's the pressure difference due to the weight of the water. So this row right here is the fluid density. Sometimes we just leave off a subscript. Sometimes we emphasize it's the fluid density with the subscript F. Does this equation make sense? So what is the net force from the two fluids acting on the top and the bottom? Don't we get a fluid force equal to the pressure on the bottom, which is greater, minus the pressure on the top, which is less, times the cross-sectional area. If it was around, it'd be like a pi r squared. Okay, well then we, we do this, we put in our equation, and what we get is rho of the fluid. Gravity, if you don't have gravity, you're not going to have a variation of density in the fluid, right? Go to zero g, forget it, it times h times area. What is the h times the area? That's our volume of the object that's been submerged. And there it is. If you did it for a little cylinder, then you just uh, put a bunch of little uh, cylinders to, to make up the object. And you have that principle. You derived it. Okay? So this is the weight of the fluid that's displaced. Let's solve a problem. 
we have an elastic air balloon initially has a diameter of so much d1 is the initial diameter it's uh, the initial really doesn't matter but it's 30 centimeters it's attached to the base of a container that's partially filled with water so here's our container it's partially filled with water is the container open at the top or closed at the top closed closed at the top but it has some air in the container and some water in the container and uh, the weight of the balloon and the air inside the balloon are negligible. So I know it's a little tricky, but maybe they should have said this is a helium-filled balloon. And then we have air above the water in the sealed tank, rigid tank. Something like that. Because we have air and air, that's okay. But, but there it is, okay? But they're saying that the mass of the helium in the balloon or mass of air in the balloon is zero, negligible. And then the fabric that makes up the balloon... The, is negligible. It's just, just negligible. Well, we know it has some weight. We know it has some mass, but we're going to neglect it. The diameter of the balloon is related to the air pressure in the container. What do you mean by that? Well, maybe they can vary the pressure. Maybe it starts at 100 kilopascal, goes to 200, 300, 400. They change the air pressure. How would they do that? Put, a, put, a, put, put air supply to it and, and a pressure regulator and Boost the pressure. You see how you could do this experimentally? Yeah. So we can change the pressure. What they're telling us, though, is that if the pressure of the air changes, let me ask you this. If I change the air pressure by increasing it, let's say, 500 kilopascal. It used to be 100. I increased the air pressure by 500. What's the final air pressure in the tank? 600. Okay, let's say the pressure down here in the water, oh, it's greater than 100 kilopascal, because that's the air pressure. How much greater is it? Well, it's, it's P1 plus rho of the water, because it's water, G times whatever depth this is, H. True? Let's say now I don't change the depth of the water. All I'm changing is the adding 500 kilopascal. I'm boosting the air pressure by 500 kilopascal. What happens to the pressure of the water at the bottom? It's going to go up by 500 kilopascal. True? All right. Did the, did the level of the water go down because I boosted the air pressure by 500 kilopascal? Why did it not go down? It's a rigid tank, and now, if it would go anything, if I changed the volume of the balloon and shrunk it, then yeah, the water level is going to go down some. But let's assume that this tank is pretty wide. It's a large tank. So even if the balloon volume goes down a little or increases a little, the water level is going to stay the same. Water is incompressible. Okay. Now what do they do is they say the air pressure above the water is increased. Will the tension in the cable, where's the cable? C-A-B-L-E right here. Will the tension in the cable increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? So you have initial setup. Balloon submerged. Do you understand why there's tension in the cable? So now they say that they're going to change the air pressure above the water. They're going to increase it. What's going to happen to the tension in the cable? And I'm going to pause and walk around. Can you tell me what happens to the tension in the cable? Does the tension in the cable go up? Does it go down? Does it stay the same? And one other thing that they told us was that as I change the pressure, it's related to the diameter of this balloon. So the, it's a constant times a diameter to the minus 2. So if I change the pressure, what happens to the diameter of the balloon? It's going to change. 
can you tell by the negative 2 which way it goes? It'll go down. It'll become smaller. If I increase the pressure, then the diameter of the balloon gets smaller. Uh, maybe in another way to write that is P is equal to C over D squared, or P times D squared is equal to C. Does that make sense? So if the pressure goes up, I know this is D squared, but D squared has to go down to remain a constant. So let me see if you can figure out what happens to the tension in the cable if the air pressure is increased. Okay, um, how, what's the key on this? You got to do an FBD. What is an FBD? Free body diagram of what? The balloon. The balloon. And so if we do a free body diagram of the balloon, then what do we know about the balloon? It could have some W going down at, acting at the center of the balloon. What would W stand for? Weight. But what about the weight for this problem? What did they give us information to help us say something about the weight? It's negligible. And then we have to cut. When you do a free body diagram, you come in and you have to cut. I know I'm exaggerating it. I'm just focusing at the balloon. But I have to cut that cable. When I cut that cable, what do I have going down? T, tension. And then we have all these little hydrostatic forces acting on the balloon, on the side, the top, the bottom. But you know, we can replace all of those little hydrostatic forces acting all the way around by one force, one net force, called the buoyancy force. And it will be upward directed, the force buoyancy. And we know the magnitude of buoyancy, buoyancy force. What is it? It's equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So we get the gamma of the fluid, the weight density of the fluid, and we multiply that by the volume of the balloon. Isn't that the buoyancy force? Oh, it's complicated. Archimedes' principle to do that summation over all of the volume, the, the, the surface area of that volume, is complicated, but it comes to a very simple compact result that I can get the net buoyancy force upward directed is boom, that. All right, so I say, how does the tension in the cable change? Does it change because the air pressure changes, maybe the fluid density on the top and the bottom of the balloon and the sides of the balloon? How? No, it doesn't really do that because the buoyancy force is not related to how deep it is. If I put, here's a, maybe I should have asked this question. If this is submerged right here, and I have the balloon with the long tension, or I have the balloon, the same exact size of the balloon, but it's a lot deeper in the water, will I have a different tension in the cable? No. No, I will not. Now, somebody says, I have two balloons, one small, one large, at the same depth. Doesn't even matter the depth, but I'm not trying to confuse you with depth. One small balloon, one large balloon. How about the tension in this cable versus the tension in that cable? Are they the same? I have them submerged at the same level. It's proportional to the volume, the tension in the cable. So this one's going to be much, much greater. T2 is much, much greater than T1. That's the key. That's the key. See, you do a free body diagram. The sum of the forces in the Y must equal to zero because it's not going up or down. It's just sitting there. And you find that the tension is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced and the volume of the balloon tells me how much fluid's displaced. All right. So 
if the air pressure above is increased, we already talked about this equation, if the air pressure goes up, what happens to the diameter of the balloon? It must go down to make that constant. This is a requirement given in the problem statement. Smaller diameter, smaller volume, smaller buoyancy force, smaller tension in the cable. So what happened to the tension in the cable? As the air pressure up here goes up, the tension in the cable goes down. True? All right, you ready to continue this problem? But I have to move to a clean sheet. Same problem. But now we said that we say that it goes from 100 kilopascal to 1600 kilopascal or 1 1.6 megapascal. All you're doing is changing this pressure to 1.6 megapascal. Your same requirement that the pressure of the air above the water tank and the air above the water in the tank is uh, equal to a constant times the diameter of the balloon to the negative two power. Calculate the change in the tension in the cable. What are they asking you to find? Well, maybe you have one subscript is the initial when the, uh, I can't spell when, when pressure one is equal to 100 kilopascal and two is the final, and that's when pressure two is equal to 1600 kilopascal. See one initial state one, final state two, what did you do? You changed the air pressure. So how do you, what are we asked to calculate? The change in the tension in the cable. Well, you could say T2 minus T1. The, first of all, what do you think about that T2 minus T1? Do you think it's positive or negative? It's going to be negative. I'm, I'm looking for a negative change. True? All right. So I go back and I could do that free body diagram and I find that the tension is equal to the weight density of the water times the volume. The volume at one and one, that's equal to the weight density of water. That's not changing, it's incompressible. Times the volume at one. What's the volume at one? Is it, uh, what is the volume of a sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. Is it also equal to pi d cubed over six? If I put it in diameters instead of radius. Is it pi d cubed over six? Sure. And so it's uh, pi over six diameter one cubed. True. Now, give me an equation for T2. Well, it's going to be the same density of water volume 2. That's going to be gamma water pi over 6 d2 ah, cubed. True. Now, I'm uh, needing to use this information right here. Because the pressure one affects the diameter one, and the pressure two affects the diameter two. So what we can do is we can say that, um, that uh, over here, I'll just doodle a little bit. P uh, times D squared is equal to a constant always. So is D1, uh, P, I'm sorry, P1, D1 squared equal to uh, P2, D2 squared. All right. And so what we can say is that uh, the diameter final is equal to diameter initial times the pressure initial divided by the pressure final to the one half power. Does that look okay? Substitute that here, and that we get the uh, 
density of uh, mass, weight density of water, pi over 6, d1 cubed, p1 over p2 to a power. What power? Three halves. And they said you'd never learned anything in your math classes. Look at that. Of course you learned a lot. Right? All right. So if I'm interested in calculating, I didn't leave enough room, I had to scroll down, sorry about that, T2 minus T1, is it going to be weight density, pi over 6, D1 cubed, then we'll have P1 over P2 to the 3 halves minus 1. If I want to do that as a percentage or a fraction of the initial tension, could I divide by the initial tension? And all of this just cancels. And now somebody with the calculator can say, I'm starting at 100. I'm going to 1600. I'll take the three halves, subtract one, and that will be my percent change. Remember, I'm expecting a negative sign. So what do I get for this number? Negative something. How many people can calculate that with me? You got it? Um, this is negative 0 0.984. Good. Two confirmed. Three confirmed. Four confirmed. So this is, a, it goes down by 98.4%. That's a huge change. That, that balloon got a lot smaller by increasing the air pressure above. That makes sense? And uh, that's the correct answer. All right, let's continue on. Well, now we talk about fluid when you have rigid motion. I like to think of the easy one first. Think about a tank of water just like this. We're going to put gravity this way. We'll put Z going up. We'll put uh, pressure at the top of the liquid, liquid density rho, it's not moving, the pressure at the bottom of the liquid. But what do you know, what is this case right here they're showing you? It's as if it's being dropped and it's free falling in the Earth's surface with no aerodynamic drag or anything, you know, it's just free falling. So if it's free falling, what's its acceleration? It's downward directed acceleration, it's free falling toward the surface of the Earth, and its magnitude is 9.81 or 32.2, it's, it's G, that's the, the, the free fall acceleration. So if I take a, a, a a, a column of liquid and I let it free fall, what's the difference between the pressure at the top and the pressure at the bottom? Nothing, because <laughs> it's free falling. Similarly, you could take this column of liquid out into space where there's negligible gravity. There's no Earth's gravity operating on it. You're not on the surface of the moon, which has a smaller G, when you're not on the surface of a huge planet. What's a huge planet in our system? Pluto? No. With Jupiter. Jupiter, which would have a huge G, right? A large G. So you're, you're far away where there's no, you're in the no G land. No G, zero G, right? If I have a column of fluid, is there a diff pressure difference between the top and the bottom of the column of fluid? No. No. So understand this case. Good. Now what do we do? We don't 
you know, what's your, what, what's your worst nightmare is when you get in the elevator and you're afraid that you're in the 20th floor in the elevator and the cable snaps and you're going to free fall. It's not the free fall. That'll be exciting. It's just a couple millisecond impact at the bottom that's not the, that you dread, right? Well, just the opposite. Get in the elevator, push the button, and sometimes you'll feel it accelerate upward. Can you feel it sometimes on these fast ele? Well, put the column of fluid in an elevator, accelerate it upward, boom. Okay. So if you accelerate it upward, and let's say you accelerate it not just by a little bit, but you accelerate it by 9.81 meters per second squared upward, what's it do to your buck, your knees, and everything? You feel like, let's say you normally weigh uh, 200 pounds, you feel like, ooh, I weigh like. 400 pounds, your poor knees and your ankles feel it, right? Because most of your weight's above their knees and your ankles and you feel it. Well, anyway, uh, what would happen here to a liquid layer is the pressure at the bottom would not just go up by rho GH, it would go up by two because you had an additional. Let's do this. Let's just say A sub Z is positive. I'm not saying it's equal to G but it's greater than zero. What would be P2? Would it be P1 plus uh, rho G plus A sub Z times H? Yeah, wouldn't that make sense? So, so if you're accelerating, <laughs> uh, it can affect the hydrostatic pressure. This is rigid body motion of the fluid. We're not shearing the fluid, it's just in rigid body motion. Okay? Okay. So uh, this would accentuate the hydrostatic pressure. Well, what happens if I take that container and not just accelerate it up or accelerate it down, but accelerate it to the side? What's going to happen to the container of fluid? It'll shift. It'll shift. So if I'm going to accelerate it in the positive x direction, a sub x greater than zero, which way is my fluid interface? Go to shift that way? Isn't that the way it'll shift? Sure. Okay. So what you'll pick up is a shifted free surface. Now, what is uh, this? This is the normal direction of just G by itself. And it would be perpendicular to the dashed line, which is a horizontal line. G is perpendicular to the dashed line, horizontal line. But if I introduce a positive a sub x, right? If I introduce a positive a sub x, then what happens to this? It shifts by an angle theta, doesn't it? Can you see what they're doing? They're introducing this angle theta right here, this angle. And it's as if... I actually just tilted the container by an angle theta. I know this is math here, but this is a couple different ways of looking at it. And it's as if I took that a sub x, turned it around, and I have a triangle. I have a triangle. Where the hypotenuse, I don't care about, as much as the two sides. The opposite and the adjacent sides of a tri right triangle. And so this angle of the shift, that's the same theta, of the, of the free surface of the fluid in a container subjected to a horizontal acceleration, theta is equal to the TAN minus 1. I forgot what the name of that. What's TAN minus 1? Yeah. Is it also known as the A tan? Is it also the ARC tan? Why doesn't the science just to get together and call it one name and be done? Well, I know a lot of you go around, you got more than one name. You got your legal name, and then you have your nickname, then you have your real intimate friend's nickname, you know, that they call you, right? Well, anyway, here you go. It's different names for the same thing. But isn't it, this going to be uh, A sub X divided by G? And that, then you get the angle of that surface due to, what is it? Free body, the solid, it's not deforming the fluid. There's a little transient, I know, but just think about constant acceleration. 
All right, so you're in the car. That's my rendition of the car. There's some wheels to the car. And you're having a container of water. It's a soda beverage container glass of water, but it's big enough that you can look down and you can see it sloshing or changing elevation. And the fluid layers like this as you drive. And now uh, you're at a red light, you're stopped, and, and it turns green. It turns green. So you push on the accelerator. What does the car do? Starts moving in the X direction. Is in, in the, for a while, it'll be constant acceleration until you let off the gas. But let's assume it's just, you're going to give it a long time of constant acceleration A. What happens to the water level in the glass? Does it shift? Yeah, the water's going to be accelerating too. It's going to go with you. It's not like you're going to put it out the window and just leave it and fall. No, it's going to shift. It's going to go that way. True? All right. You go down the road. It's cruising. Now it's no more acceleration because you're at 60 miles an hour and you're not going trying to get to 70 and 80. You're not accelerating. But you see a red light. What do you do? You brake. What happens to the water? It's going to go the opposite direction. True? Okay, very good. Let's do this. I have very, very, very sensitive instruments to measure air pressure inside. I have one just on the inside window, front windshield, and one on the inside of the back windshield of my car. And they measure air pressure. I'm sitting at the light. I'm not accelerating the car. Is the same elevation, is there a difference in the air pressure? All right. Light turns green. I punch it. I'm accelerating the car. Is there a difference in the air pressure on the back? This would be the back window and the front. Remember, this is glass, and we're both on the inside of the car, not the outside of the car. It's inside of the car. Is there a difference in the air pressure? Slight difference that you're going to pick up and be able to measure with good instrumentation. Yes or no? Yeah, sure is. Which one's going to have a slightly higher pressure? The back. You brake. When you hit the brakes, does it switch? Yeah, because you're decelerating. All right, now the hard one. You're going to the birthday party, and you were supposed to pick up a helium-filled balloon. And so you picked it up, and you have it in the car. And you set it with the string on the passenger seat next to you. And so it's sitting there in the car. And you have a little brick or rock or book or whatever you have to tie to the string to hold it down so it's sitting there in the car. If you cut the string, where would the balloon go and rest on the top? I don't want the balloon to rest on the top of the car, the hood, uh, you know, inside, what do you call that? Not hood. Uh, the what? Headliner. You don't want it to rest on the headliner. You want it to just sit there. It's straight up and down because it's a red light. And you've been sitting there a long time. But as soon, as soon as that light turns green, you punch it. Does the balloons just stay sitting up there? How many people have ever had a balloon in a car? Only you experience what I'm talking about? All right, I'm going to pause. You tell me which way the balloon goes when you punch it. So uh, the surprising thing is, is when you accelerate, the balloon actually goes that way, toward the front. Huh? Well, a couple ways of thinking about it. Maybe the air pressure back here is like it's hydrostatic from the lighter front to the back. Or you think about you do have a buoyancy force on this balloon. That's why it has to be tethered. It has to be tethered, held straight down. But it's the same thing is, is you have as um, the, the, the accelerator, by moving the car forward here, it's as if 
there's a body force on all the fluid surrounding the balloon toward the back, hence you have a buoyancy force toward the front. And then just the opposite will happen with the balloon. If you are going to brake, decelerate the vehicle, which way does the balloon go? Toward the back, toward the back of the vehicle. All right, does that help? All right. Once you have linear motion with acceleration of water in a rigid body, then guess what you can do? Rotate. What type of motion is that? Angular, rotational motion. And uh, talk about a particle that's sitting out here. It's undergoing a rotational constant speed omega. Put it in radians per second. Isn't that omega? Talk about this little chunk of mass in order for it to continue in a circular motion, does it need to have a acceleration? And what is the magnitude of that acceleration from what previous class did you master this concept in? Dynamics. And it's one of those surprising things out of dynamics. As I hold it, the speed of that object is always the same. The velocity as a vector of that object is always changing. But the magnitude of the velocity, known as the speed, is always the same. But in order to have a constantly changing velocity, I have to have a acceleration. Do I have an acceleration in the tangential direction or the radial direction? It's a radial only. So it's like a sub t is equal to zero, but a sub r is negative, inward directed. And what's the magnitude of a sub r related to this parameter? And r. I forgot what r was. The radius. Yeah. Omega squared r. And if you like to work and think that's the positive r direction, put a negative on it because it's toward the center. Isn't that the acceleration? Okay. Does this give me the right units of acceleration? What was uh, G? 9.81 meters per second squared. Length time squared. Does this give me length time squared? Sure. Sure. All right. Uh, one other thing, what is the speed of the object, the magnitude of that? What is the speed of that object equal to? Omega r. So sometimes you could put a sub r in terms of v. But that's just algebra. But this is probably the form that most people remember it in. True for the radial acceleration going in a circular motion around the point of radius r. So what do we have on that? As you, what, you're going to get a, a, a profile of the liquid water surface. Will it be straight? Will it be like this? No, it'll be like that. It'll be concave up, won't it? Why do you get a surface like that? Before it was constant acceleration in x, I had a linear profile tilted. How do I get this one? I mean, think about a little chunk of fluid here. There's R1. And a little chunk of fluid here. There's R2. Do they have the same radial inward directed acceleration? No. They have the same omega. But what's different? R is different. <laughs> the distance from the center line or axis of rotation. So uh, what you're picking up is you're picking up an acceleration that way, and it goes a larger acceleration as you move further out and larger, larger radius. True? Okay. So 
what do we do here? Well, you have to set up the governing differential equation. You still have the change in the pressure with respect to, do they introduce Z? They're Z. They're Z. Which is it? Is it upward directed? Which way is G? Downward directed. So is it equal to the change in P with respect to Z, not rho? Did that look like a rho to you? It's P, right? The change in pressure with respect to Z is negative rho G. True or false? And then if I put this on an elevator and I think about having A sub Z positive acceleration upward, I could, you know, more general, make it more general, minus rho G plus A sub Z. Uh, let's say I let this thing free fall. If I let it free fall in a gravitational field, I'll still have G acting downward, but if I have it free fall, a sub z will be negative g, this will cancel, I'll have the, what I talked about. So the pressure change as I go uh, up in the elevation of the fluid won't change, it won't decrease. This is a negative sign showing it would normally decrease as you go up. Now let's talk about the change in the pressure with respect to R. We just did it for z. Now we need to do it for R. Would it be the uh, rho times the acceleration, which is in the R? Well, first of all, it'll be a negative, but it'll be a negative omega squared R. So what does the pressure do? Is it rho omega squared r? Think about this. I know that this is hard to handle with this negative sign right here on the z, but if I increase z, I go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5, 6, all that. I'm increasing z. Does the pressure go up or down? It goes down. That's why there's a negative sign here. How about I have this thing. It's rotating at constant omega. If I go out, 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 what does the pressure do? Is it going up or down? Same Z, not changing Z. I'm just changing R. That's why there's a plus right there. Make sense? So now you have a governing differential equation. And... Uh, you have to solve for P, not only as a function of R, but also of Z. And what you find is that the, uh, the pressure is equal to some P naught, some reference state, minus rho G Z, uh, get rid of A sub Z for now. Don't generalize it to A sub Z, plus one half rho omega squared r squared. Where do you get the r squared? You're going to separate and integrate. You're going to put that, you're going to put the dr over here and then you're going to integrate and you're going to get the how the pressure changes. It changes not just as a function of r but you pick up the r squared, the one half r squared. So maybe you put the p naught uh, at this free surface and as I go down I pick up hydrostatic and as I go out I pick up this uh, component due to the constant uh, rotation and if I wanted to what I have to do is I have to move up in Z up in Z to maintain the P is equal to P naught along that free surface and now we can see why that free surface isn't a straight line but it's quadratic in R. All right. Uh, I don't have time, sorry. Solve a lot of problems but let's move into the kinematics.